Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Straight From The Ben. Tonight, oh geez, we have a treat for you. Uh, we have Mark Black. Mark is a, uh, he's many things, but he's an inspirational speaker, he's an author, uh, he's an entrepreneur. I mean, I get into all his accolades in the, uh, in the beginning of the podcast, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, we had a very fruitful conversation with Mark uh, about his story and his, his goals and what he's trying to put out there in the world. And uh, so it was very interesting and inspiring, to say the least. So, um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. We'll, uh, we'll let you discover Mark uh, a little bit further throughout the podcast. But uh, needless to say, Al and I had a great time talking with Mark. So uh, without further ado, here we go. Our podcast with Mark Black. Testing. Testing one, two. Two, five, seven. Test. Two, five, seven. Welcome. To straight from the band. Probably the most average podcast ever. In three, two, one. Al. <laughs> Fern the man. How's it going? Pretty good. How about you? Good. Yeah, winter's almost over. Oof. Yeah, that's my optimism for tonight. Yeah? Well, yeah. Yeah. You mean we're not going to die in a... Uh, you know, well, there is you know, climate change. Climate change. Yeah. There is climate change, but we're not going to go there tonight. No, we have a guest with us. We're going to be inspired. We're, we're going to inspire you. Yes. yes. I'm, I'm inspired already. Your uh, your faith in in people is going to change after tonight. I'm I sure. know. It's already changed because I watched a YouTube video this oh, yeah, afternoon. Yeah. Yes, I know. Right? A TED talk. So tonight we have a very special guest, Mark Black. Um, for some of you probably already know, Mark Black, uh, a double lung and heart transplant recipient, author of uh, Love, Live Life from the Heart, marathon runner, inspirational speaker, Crazy. podcaster, family man, entrepreneur, coach. I mean, Mark, is there anything you haven't done yet? Oh, plenty. <laughs> plenty, plenty. Welcome, Mark. Glad, Welcome. glad to be here. Glad to be here. So, so glad to have you. Yeah. So, Mark, give us uh, give us a quick. Again, I, we were talking a little bit before we started, but uh, as as interesting as your past is, I mean, I'm a lot more. I think I'm even more interested in what you're doing now. But uh, give us a quick rundown as to. Sure. Yeah, your, I'll give you the the Reader's Digest version. The, yeah. The, the thirty second version. Um, yeah, so I was born with a with a congenital heart problem. I know this sounds like it's going to be super long when you say I was born with, but we'll fast forward through like 25 years. Really How old fast, are you, Mark? Yeah. <laughs> old. Feeling old. older by the minute. <laughs> the three kids, they make me feel plenty old. Um, so yeah, so I had, I had heart issues my entire life. Had a couple of surgeries when I was a baby. And then uh, at 23, got really sick really quickly. Lost like a third of my body weight in three months. And Doctor said, you need a heart and two new lungs like yesterday or you're not going to be around for very long. So uh, they sent me to Toronto. <laughs> Just a sec. <laughs> Just a sec while I sit on Siri. Uh, <laughs> that was Siri. Oh, yeah, Siri's still talking Siri's to still you. Talk, like Siri's, oh, Siri's. Uh, so that gives me an opportunity to slide in there a question. Did you know you had lung issues or you, you, you just knew about the heart issues? We just knew about the heart issues. So, in fact, the heart affected the lungs. So it was the pulmonary artery pressure, it's called, um, in my lungs that caused, it was caused by the heart that required the lungs to be transplanted as well. So it wasn't really a breathing issue so much as a blood pressure issue. Gotcha. So the surgeons prefer it that way, actually. So the, the heart lung transplant is a simpler surgery to do huh. than just a heart or just lungs because they don't, they're so interconnected that yeah, they don't yeah, have to yeah, separate yeah. them, which never occurred to me until I talked to a surgeon. Hmm. They talk about taking out the whole engine block instead of only taking out pieces. Yeah, of yeah, interesting. Like, all right, always yeah. compared to a motor. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, cars are everything. Listen, a heart's just a pump, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of the day. Yes, That's all it is. So, uh, so yeah, I was on the transplant list for almost a year in Toronto, and then uh, had the transplant in September of two thousand and two, and really haven't looked back. Just all like, I mean, we were given a laundry list of things that might go wrong, and I've just been really, really fortunate that most of those things haven't happened. So excellent. Yeah. 
and then and then I fell into becoming a speaker totally by accident. We can get into that if that's interesting, but uh, had zero intentions of doing that. Because you started as a teacher, weren't you? I was, yeah. I was in halfway through my Bachelor of Education degree when I got really sick and had to, to leave that to go get the transplant. And then afterwards, you're on immune suppression therapy so that your organs don't get rejected by your body. Mm-hmm. And so the doctor said, look, there's like two things. You're pretty unlimited in what you can do. We like to avoid two places, and that would be um, schools and hospitals because of the <laughs> just infection risk of young kids who don't wash their hands, basically. So I had to kind of look for an alternative career, and I did some substituting while I figured that out. And uh, yeah, just discovered speaking by complete accident, and it's worked out very nicely. Wow. So what what drew you? I mean, other than having an inspirational story, but it's one thing to have an inspirational story, but to be an inspirational speaker, like on top of that, like how did how did you how did you get into that? So I I was invited to speak at a, the graduation. F- ceremony for McNaughton local high school and uh okay I, i'm a chronological guy so how long after the surgery so about a year and a bit maybe okay it was just nice so 24 home. 25 years old yeah okay. yeah come and do your like 10 minutes and i mean we've all been we've been there as students we've probably maybe been there as as relatives and you're you know what it's like to sit in that space and listen to whoever that is usually it's a yeah. politician or somebody yeah and nobody wants to listen to that person right it's like <laughs> yeah. you're the only thing yeah. between them and the parties where yeah. the kids are concerned, right <laughs> And the parents are tired and just want to go home. So yeah. I know that my audience is not exactly excited to hear what I have to say, right? <laughs> so I thought the key here is to be as short as possible and try and make something that's maybe relevant to the kids. And I, I, to this day, I don't really know what I said. But I know that afterwards, one of the parents came up and tried to hire me to speak at his company. And I say try because I had no clue what was happening until we were halfway through this conversation. He was like, well, that's what you do, right? Like, I was like, I was like that people do that? Like, I didn't know that was a maybe, thing. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> when you talk, so, Can like, I? Yeah. He says, well, we, we pay people that like to come to work, my company and do what you just did. And I think we pay them a lot of money. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I don't know who that man is, but he launched my career by accident. So, uh, yeah, that's I started, interesting. To, started to dig in and see what that was all about and how to do it. And did my first paid speaking event for a uh, gym full of middle school students for a hundred bucks and thought I had hit the lottery and the rest is history. The rest is history. Wow. Yeah. wow that's that, yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, cause I've been kind of, since we connected and, and we just, you know, you, you graced us with your presence and stuff. <laughs> I kind of been uh, looking up and, and, and listening to your podcast and all that. And you know what? The very last one that I heard yeah. uh, is the last podcast that you did. Um, Call it. It's not about you. Hmm. Oh my God! That I honestly connected with that because it 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 was so much there that I that I connected with in the sense that this is what this is about too. This podcast. It's not about us. It's about highlighting and and celebrating other people. Hmm. And and now you tell me. (laughs) (laughs) If you think you're going to be a big star out of this, (laughs) jeez, it's not about me. But. uh, (laughs) But that was very, very interesting because it, it, that's exactly what it is, right? It's about, and I think that's where your message is coming from, right? A, a, a big part of it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I had to learn. I mean, I think as most of us do, we learn all the good lessons the hard way, right? Or at least, uh, at least men do. I think. <laughs> I, always, I always joke. I always joke that we seem to need to learn it multiple times. The women seem to pick up faster. But anyway, yeah, I, I um, and it's interesting because as a, as any kind of chronically ill person it's very easy for life to be all about you because like you, mm, it takes a lot of time yeah. and energy. And for that whole year, my family was turned upside down because of me and my parents rearranged their work and my three brothers were left at home a lot by themselves. And so it's very easy. And I, I did like, it was all about me. And then my mother corrected me one day and taught me that it wasn't. And, <laughs> uh, and then slowly I've been relearning that lesson every year since then. But um, yeah, that wasn't a very fun time. And part of that was because it was all about me and it didn't feel good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So where do you get, because I've listened to a qu- quite a few of your podcasts, like where do you get this insight? Where do you get your material, I, I would say? like, um, I would love to say that there's like this big strategic plan for the whole year of what every episode is going to be. <laughs> nah. Usually it's like Tuesday and I'm thinking, okay, i got to have another episode out next Monday. What am I <laughs> going to talk about? Um, and I'll flip through. I've got a you know bookshelf full of self-help, personal development mm-hmm. books that I've yeah. read and yeah. 
Uh, sometimes I'll go into my own book. Sometimes I'll watch a YouTube video or something. I'll spot something and take note and go, oh, that's a good subject to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm just always trying to think of something that, that has been useful to me that might be useful to somebody else right. and try and share it with them. That's really all it's about. So you mentioned your book. Like, t- Let's talk a little bit about that. What What's the – I haven't – I haven't read your book, but what's in the mostly the content of the? So it's uh, it's called the subtitle is fifty two weeks to a life of passion and purpose. So it's fifty two little two three page chapters on different ideas, strategies, life hacks, whatever you want to call them. All things that kind of came out of I I wrote it or took notes throughout the year that I was in the hospital and then wrote it about the year and a half after the transplant, uh, mostly because I didn't have anything else to do. Um, <laughs> But it was, so part of it was therapy for me. It was just kind of processing all this stuff that you go through when you think you're going to die. And um, it, it has a very focusing effect that when you, when you face that period mm-hmm. in your life wow. about what's my, what matters and what doesn't. And so I just tried to write about that, you know, what, what things really count and how to make your time count and all that kind of stuff. And what came out of that with the help of a lot of editors to shape my like ramblings into something that looks something like a book uh, is that book. And it's like, I don't know. 12 years old now or something like that. Yes. Actually, the second edition is about to come out. Um, So note for anybody out there that's thinking about writing a book, don't put your face on the cover. It sounded like a good idea at the time. (laughs) But if it lasts a while, all of a sudden I'm selling books to the back of the room at an event and they're like, is that you? (laughs) Yeah, it is. I'm just a lot younger than I am now. Uh, Yeah. So you were quite young then when you wrote that. Yeah, I was like 25, 26, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Mark... um who is the mark after surgery very different than the mark before? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, I, no, I don't think any more than than you're a different version of your the, of yourself 17 years later. Um, I, certainly, I learned a lot of things in that process. But again, I I had the the luxury, and that sounds counterintuitive, maybe, but to have been born with an illness, and so in the sense in that sense, I didn't know different. Like I I spent a lot of time. I was in the hospital for six months before the the transplant. So I saw a lot of people come and go. And a lot of those people, especially heart patients are between 50 and 70. And a lot of them were healthy their whole life. And then it's a heart attack or a virus or some kind of catastrophic health event. And I, I, they reminded me of how fortunate I was to kind of that hospitals were normal, that dealing with test results and all the kind of things that you deal with when you're in that situation was not a foreign thing. It was kind of normal as normal as that can be anyway hmm. so uh, yeah I, I'm, I'm certainly different I've evolved but I don't think there was this dramatic shift because that we knew for years that yeah that, that was so coming you, so you never took life for granted I hope not I mean I'm sure I definitely have my days yeah um, but but overall I think I it's a little again it's just it's easier to be to keep things in perspective when when there, that reality is in your face all the yes. time right mm-hmm. that's, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cuz I mean even now like the transplant is a is a treatment not a cure. That's how they that's how they phrase that for us. And so Interesting. Yeah, cuz it is cuz it's it it's when it works it's treating one set of problems for another more preferable set of challenges. So like I take 20 pills a day still. The organs are always at risk of rejecting. And always then, still. Oh yeah, really? yeah forever. Oh, well, 17 yeah. years later. Yeah. Yeah, the typical heart lasts 10 to 25 years, depending. L- typical lungs, much shorter. Like when I was transplanted, they said your odds of surviving for five years are 50-50. Wow. So like I've been on bonus time for a long time. Wow. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's nothing to indicate it. Just actually I was at a clinic appointment today and everything looks good. There's no indi- there's no indication that anything's changing anytime soon. But at the yeah. same time, I'm certainly definitely on a clock that's tighter than most folks probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, I'm, I'm you know middle-aged man in not in the greatest shape of my life and uh, sometimes I think to myself maybe I should run a marathon <laughs> but I don't <laughs> um, you have a heart transplant lung transplant and you say you know what what am I gonna do now let's run a marathon yeah so what how did that happen because uh, I'm hard-headed and stubborn <laughs> <laughs> and an interesting fact too that I read on your on your site you're the first man in history yes. to run a marathon. Three times. Well, even four the first. Times. Yeah, four oh, is times. it four times now? Yeah. 
yeah. with a heart and lung transplant. The first yeah. one. In, yeah. That's, I mean, that's something. Yeah. So was yeah. that crossing your mind when you did it? Or was mm, just no, I didn't even know that no. that was the case until okay. later. I, someone, someone's gonna like, oh, has that like have a lot of people done that? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I never start to do some Google. Re- and I, so I have there's a little asterisk there or something in my bio that's like, as far as I can tell, <laughs> based on a whole lot of googling. Um, yeah, there have been other heart recipients and other double lung recipients, but the heart lung combo, wow. which is first of all that that surgery is fairly rare. Like mm. the year in two thousand and one, when I was waiting, they didn't do a single heart lung transplant in, in Canada that year. And then the year I had mine, I think I was one of four or five. So you were already in pretty kind of rare company there anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was. I've always kind of been the person to just. I need a challenge to be motivated to do something. Like if there's no carrot at the end of the stick like i admire the people who do the things that are good for them just because it's good for them i'm not i'm not one of those people <laughs> <laughs> do you need the challenge yeah i need something need... to to strive for so right. like wow. yeah so that was it, it was about it was mostly about proving to myself i could do it and and knowing that if i could do that then it probably meant i could do a lot of other things so That's crazy obviously it must have been hard it must have been a lot of training a lot of yeah, yeah. I mean, look, people, people run marathons. I forget what the stat is. It's only yeah. How many hundreds of thousands of people run them every year? So it's not certainly not crazy challenging. Cause lots of people do it. If you go to one, you realize quickly actually how not special you are, and how like I, I can vividly remember being being passed by like women in their sixties, right? And I'm like, okay, so I'm not really that special here. And in fact, I'm not even that good an athlete. But I did it, so that's that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just logging the miles. I tell anybody that that says, "Oh, I could never do that," and I always say, "No, you just don't want to," which is fine. Like yeah. not everybody wants to, but anybody who wants to can. You just have to yeah, log yeah, the absolutely. miles and get your body ready. My marathon achievement is interviewing someone who's done it four times. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there Thank you, go. you. Ching ching. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like when I was looking at uh, in, in the most part of your podcast, I think the the big message out of that is that is to live live every moment for the for the moment right and i think that's is, is and and even like i i listen to your uh, ted talk as well and yes. i think that's the the big message that you're trying to get across yeah yeah absolutely i mean it's it's nuanced right so it's it's about i mean i think anybody who's faced a life and death situation takes away some form of that lesson, which is that, look, we all do. We go to, you go to a funeral, you like any, you read a newspaper article, we all get that flash of like, oh crap, yeah, I'm not going to be around forever. Mm. Um, but when it happens at a young age and and the risk continues for ongoing, it's a constant reminder. And so it's not, you know, a lot of people will say, live every day like it's your last day, which I don't know if you actually try and do that, it becomes really impractical really quickly. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but it, it is about trying to be present and, and taking advantage of each day as best as you can and and trying to, for me anyway, trying to, to both squeeze as much life into it in terms of experiences, but also contribute in, in some way as much as I can while I can for however long I can. Hmm. I watched your, uh, your talk at uh, Queen's University. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I misread or you were getting choked up? Were you choked up? Yeah. Yeah, it happens. It's funny. I so I mean I've told the story literally five hundred, six hundred times now. <laughs> yeah, um, and every once in a while, it still it still catches me. Yeah, hmm. um, it's interesting. There's in the speaking industry, people who speak about their own journeys have different ways of doing it. Some people, it's more of a performance than it is a conversation. Like mm-hmm. every word is choreographed, every oh, gesture yeah, yeah. is choreographed, mm-hmm. and 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 you can as an audience member, you can usually tell. Um, when the tear comes at exactly the right time, like, yes. um, that's, I, I can't memorize. So that just never worked for me. Um, so when I get choked up, it's completely genuine, but the downside is I also don't have the choice. It just kind of sometimes it happens <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for, I don't know what was happening that day or what was going on. So probably something was going on in the background that caused that to happen. But, um, yeah, that was good. That was good. It was, uh, you know, uh, what happens when you know that you got one year to live, right? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. uh, that that you must you must make people cry. Yeah, I often get that feedback. Um, it's again, it's not intentional. No, no, does, no, but, but it, it's a, it's 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 it gets you. That story it's gets you. Yeah, it, yeah, it does. It's a, it's funny as a. I mean, when I first started speaking, I was twenty five, um, and single, and now 
you know, married for 13 years and parent of three kids. And, and so I see my story, my, I see my own story from a completely different vantage point, mm -hmm. right? Because I imagine what it would be like if one of my kids was going through. I have a whole new appreciation for my parents who were who yeah. superheroes. Like, I mean, I always knew they were good parents, but now I understand like the kind of people they are to have gone through what they went through and mm -hmm. made a whole lot of really difficult choices to be, you know, to be able to be with me when I needed them. And I mean, I have three younger brothers who they were trying to maintain some sort of normal life for them at the same time, yeah. and how they worked all of that out. And they were basically apart from each other for the better part of a year. And yeah, kept their marriage together like they're just they phenomenal should, they should be the ones who get interviewed all yeah the time. yeah well maybe yeah. we'll have them yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's uh, but so tell us a little bit about what you do now like uh, yeah. i mean you have a business this is your business this is what you do you're you're, you're coaching yeah uh, it's funny because when i explain it to the, like an average person who works what i call a real job um it, they don't get it, right? Because basically I go on stage for 45 to 75 minutes, depending on the event, and they write me a check that's kind of disgusting if you think about how much I'm getting paid for that hour. Um, but you have to understand that, the, A, the industry, and B, the fact that it's not like I don't get to go and do it every day, mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. or I'd be really making a lot of money. Um, but yeah, so I go to mainly, I have kind of two markets. One is professional associations, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, you have your AGM or your annual conference and you've got a keynote speaker there. That's often me. Or, uh, and I, I do a lot of work in high schools, um, in, in universities, mostly high schools, mostly cause I like it. Right. Um, it doesn't pay particularly well, but, um, it's a lot of fun and it's, it's opportunity to catch a person at one of the most influential mm -hmm. points in their life. Right. Like, I mean, we all kind of we remember the music we listened to when we were 16, mm -hmm. 17, 18, right? Mm -hmm. We remember like some landmark moments in our lives happened during that, that period in your life. And so it's the number of times that I get students telling me, you know, Oh, you, you, it's also, it's also usually pretty dramatic because of, because of the age. Right. So, you know, that changed my life or that lesson. I'm going to remember that. And, and every time it's stuff that their parents have probably told them a hundred <laughs> times. Mm -hmm. I have the teachers will come up and be like, I tell them that three yeah. times a week. Yeah. But I, I mean, as yeah. parents, you know, yeah. if their friend tells them, all of a sudden it's a brilliant idea, even though yes. you've been saying it forever, exactly. right? And so, yeah, it's a chance to kind of reinforce things that they're already being taught, probably, but just in from somebody who's maybe not an authoritarian figure, and so maybe they'll absorb it or listen to it in a different way. Mm. And so that's one part, but the the other part is you also do like coaching, right? Yeah. For, uh, for businesses and, and yeah yeah most of my most of my clients tend to be um, business owners and entrepreneurs and that just kind of by accident um, people and, and the coaching thing was by accident I I don't sound like a very good business person I, there was not a whole lot of strategy to any of this <laughs> but uh, <laughs> people would come up after my speeches and say okay well like what else can you do like how can I like how can I get you in my living room like I want you to like I want you to be with me <laughs> right I'd be like, well, I don't know, I, people do this coaching thing, I guess. I don't like we could try that. I don't know. So it kind of it, it came from act from an accident, and and then over time, I kind of started to understand a that I could help people who were dealing with stressful situations, which is life in general, mm -hmm. um, and kind of help them get some perspective around that. And then that evolved to oh well, now I've been running my own business for twelve years, and there are people out there who are starting who are asking me questions about how did you do this and how did you do that, and certainly how do you become a speaker, but also just how do you how do you find clients? How do you do marketing? Like all just basic business right. things. And so I ended up starting to do a lot more work with entrepreneurs. Um, they also are more willing to invest in themselves and their business than mm -hmm. the average person is willing to invest mm -hmm. in themselves. So, so, um, so yeah, I've been doing coaching for probably seven or eight years now. And right now I'm working with a group of, of seven or eight speakers who are from at different points in their careers. And most of them trying to transition into doing more, what we would call keynote speaking. So on the stage in front of a lot of people versus mm -hmm. doing workshops and things. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's just a chance to, to pass on yeah. what other people have taught me or what I've learned by, by trial and error. And if you can save people some money and time by giving them the shortcuts, then that's, that's fun. So is it a community of speakers or is it a competition of speakers? Depends on who you ask. I think it's a community. I think most people, most people who are, who have been in it for a while get that it's a community. But we also probably all come into it thinking it's it's competition because it is. It's a little bit of that too. Well, yeah, because um, if you have the same niche uh, clientele, yeah, you know, I've got some of my best friends. 
um, are people that speak on complementary topics, for example. Uh, but what you figure out over time is that as a speaker, part of your job is just doing a great job so that whoever you worked for is going to hire another speaker again. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. oftentimes people yes. have a bad speaker and they go, oh, We're speakers, never gonna, no. speakers aren't worth the money. Yeah, right. Not never that ever. speaker wasn't worth the money. Yeah, yeah. Right? Never again. Yeah. <laughs> so we always joke now that every time I do a good job, it means you, my friend, my colleague, has a better chance of getting hired next time mm-hmm. for what you charge because we proved to them that this is a worthwhile investment. Exactly. So yeah, I have a handful of colleagues that we refer each other all the time, and it's it's great. Good. Uh, how did you come to podcasting? Um, so again, in our world, it's about the main thing for getting booked is being top of mind for clients, and so obviously you have to do some marketing and some selling, but a lot of it is just creating content, right? Yeah. Being in front mm-hmm. of them, giving them useful information. So I had a newsletter, like an electronic email newsletter, for a long time, and then those kind of went by the wayside and then everybody was yeah, doing it gets some junk mail thing yeah yeah, yeah 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 and then everybody was doing youtube channels and yeah i the production requirements of that were more than i wanted to deal with i mm-hmm. guess it's not yeah, that yeah. it couldn't be done it just was lazy yeah. um and podcasting seemed like something okay well i can sit down and crank out a half hour episode pretty easily and um then i got lucky that a friend of mine did production so i could just kind of do the recording and hand it off and not have to worry about it which which was really what sealed the deal to let me yeah, yeah, yeah. commit yeah. and be consistent, which sure. is the big, the big thing, right? Like that was the one warning I got from a lot of people. Like if you're going to do this, you can't like have an episode, wait three weeks, have another one, no, wait exactly. a month, have another one. You get yeah, like yeah, yeah. whatever yeah. your schedule is, commit to it and stick to it. And I knew that was going to be a challenge unless I had some help. So that, that kind of pushed me over the edge and it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm enjoying doing it. The downloads are going up. I don't, I can't say that it's generated revenue yet. I don't know if it has or not, but, um, but it's fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we're, we kind of have the same yeah, yeah. perspective on We it. love our 26 followers. <laughs> <laughs> we're 27 now. 27? I love it. Oh, yeah. I subscribed oh, no. today. So yeah, yeah. Even my yeah. <laughs> like you, we had no strategy. <laughs> there you go. No, no. No, no. Um, you, in your field, you always get the label motivational speaker. And yeah. I never really, because I used to be a personal trainer. Yeah. And, and, uh, I had clients that come to me and said, oh, I need motivation. Uh, and I would always tell them, oh, look, I'm not the one that's going to motivate. You have to have the motivation. I can give you the tools. I can give you the roadmap and I will inspire you as much as I can. But as far as motivation, you have to have that motivation. How, what's your, what's your view on that? Yeah, on I agree with you hundred percent. You okay. can't, you can lead the horse to water, right? As they, as the saying goes, um, <laughs> yeah. can't make yeah. them drink. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I mean, I, what I tell the person, and it's interesting because the person who books me and is ultimately writing the check is usually not the person that I'm that I'm speaking to, right? There's, they're especially in a corporate setting, the manager or the VP is bringing me in to fix their people, right? Like we have this problem, but we're gonna bring you in, and you're gonna fix it, right? And and I say, look, I'm gonna give them some tools and strategies around resilience and around dealing with adversity and dealing with challenge, and and that's gonna be helpful to them if they use it, and if they don't, then they don't, and so. Uh, yeah, I don't like the term mostly because for most people it conjures up images of either Chris Farley on Saturday Night Live or <laughs> yeah. or some cheesy guy telling you that you can you can do everything you put your mind to or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah motivation is it's not that it's not useful; it just doesn't last very long. No. So um, yeah, I I try and make it ultra practical, and uh, and then the coaching comes in to kind of maintain. And, and keep whatever those changes mm-hmm. are moving forward. And so mm-hmm. I always tell the people that hire me, look, there's there's value in this in this hour, but if you want behavior change, then you need something. I mean, just personal training be the same thing. Yeah, yeah. You bring somebody into the gym and give them a, a routine to do, unless they've got ongoing accountability and they're not going to use that routine and nothing's going to change. Hundred percent, right? so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think with your story, what what. It, it's the inspiration, right, behind your story and that look what I've been able to do with the challenges that I've had. And that's and you find that a lot with a lot of um, a lot of different speakers and, and, and people that I guess in your field that have had challenges in their past and that have to overcome. And, you know, it's I guess trial by error, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's um it was so for for the first four or five years of my career, it was, my story was just my credibility. It was the only thing that 
Mm -hmm. It was the only reason why anybody would listen to anything a 24-year-old had to say about life. Like, it's (laughs) kind of ridiculous when you think about it, except that I had had this pretty unique experience. And so that kind of got my foot in a lot of doors. And and it's funny because now I... I do my best to to position myself in a way that I actually have this expertise that I can share with people and I've got these strategies and this framework and sometimes the person hiring me totally buys into that and other times they're like we read your bio just come and tell your story that's really what we what we mm-hmm. want you to do mm-hmm. which is okay um but I just yeah again it's I've learned over time that it's not me sharing my story without you understanding why it's relevant to you is like entertainment but it's not really education it's not really mm. going to change anything for you. it's like going to a good movie right like yeah. oh that was neat but it doesn't change my life right um so i try and i try and merge the two and and if and try and help people connect whatever they're dealing with right now to my story in some way so here's a challenge i was dealing with and how i was feeling you probably felt that same way when you were dealing with x y and z mm-hmm. and give them a couple of examples um and and usually people are able to it's, it's actually it's actually pretty amazing how people are able to draw the connections to their own lived experience to something that's pretty foreign for most people. But, right. well, why do you think we we need the Mark Blacks of the world? Why do we why do people like you know going back to the motivational thing? Um, wh- why do you think? Because you must feel that connection when you talk to people and you. You did not need a motivational speaker. Oh, I do. Some you do? Well, <laughs> we're here for you. Thank so, you. <laughs> Thank but you. are you surprised? Are you surprised that people need a story like yours or some a, a Mark Black to come to them and so for the light to come on? Uh, no, because I think we all do. Like, I... I, I I would love to just say, no, look, I'm perfect and totally intrinsically motivated every day to do my best. I have bad days. Um, and I think... It is so easy to allow our focus or our perspective to narrow to our little bubble, to our little corner of the world, our little lived experience. Mm-hmm. And and the, the smaller you allow that perspective to get, the bigger a deal it is to do every, like everything becomes a big challenge, right? Like, I mean, I still have days where I'm like, well, I'm in traffic and this is annoying. And then I have to think, wait a minute, like... <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? Is this a big problem? Really? Yeah. Yeah. And if uh, it's the Moncton traffic, you really right, have an right, issue if you're right. complaining yeah, uh, about the Moncton traffic. Yeah. Right? So yeah, I think we just we all need doses of perspective on a regular basis. I think that's probably the most valuable thing that I give people is just a chance to sit back and go, wait, in the grand scheme of things, whatever I was pissed off about yeah. an hour ago now seems pretty trivial given this story I've just heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so at least for that next couple of weeks. Um, they can refer back to that and go, okay, wait a minute. This is, this is not insurmountable. I, I say to them, I, I, I have a, a, two slides near the end of my presentation. And one of them is me six days after the surgery and there's wires and tubes and mm. I weigh 80 pounds and I look like I'm on death's door. And then the, the next one is like two and a half years later at the marathon. And, and then I make the, I try very hard to make the point that this isn't about showing you what I've done, but about saying to you, like, that's the transformation I was able to do in two and a half years with a little bit of focus. And if I can do that, what can you do? Cause the truth is a lot more than you think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I hate, like you can do anything as BS. That's not, it's not true. Um, but you can do a lot more than you think. And that's what I try and kind of drill home for people is they have to get out of their own way a lot of the time and, and understand that their capacity for growth is a lot bigger than they probably mm-hmm. think it is. Because it, it's funny because you mentioned like who needs the Mark Black, but it, when you look and it frustrates me sometimes, and I catch myself as, as well. Like you see able people, like right walking around and just being either being lazy or not meeting their full potential, right? But you see them. You seem to be looking at me in a strange <laughs> way right now. Take it as you will. <laughs> Are you talking shit now? <laughs> but but then you'll see another paraplegic or somebody that's in the Olympics, like in the Paralympics. Yes. And, you know, you think there's some people there that have so much potential. Like why are – and I catch myself yeah. myself, right? I have potential of doing certain things. Why do we – 
fall in this rut and why do yeah. we kind of well that was kind of my question earlier yeah. why why so Be, what what is it that we're not getting like why do we need but i think it's the challenge i think some of us have not i've had an easy life like, yeah yeah I'll well yes it. like yes. you know i've had great parents yeah. yeah i really didn't have any much challenges in my life i was the worst part of it is i was skinny for very much part of my life right so I don't think I was challenged or or really um, had any adverse effects. But mm-hmm. there's some people, it seems like those that have gone through very difficult times come through it and have this whole different perspective on life. Yeah, I think major challenge does one of two things. It either drives you to be like bitter and angry mm. or it drives you to be better and to appreciate what you have instead of you know, instead of being angry at what you don't have. And, and I, I mean, part of, part of my work has been trying to figure out what differentiates those two groups of people. And there's a lot of factors, but, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, as I mean, you also can look at it from so many different points of view. So yeah, I've had an incredibly difficult life from a health perspective, but I was also born in like the, arguably the best country in the world to live in Yeah, to two amazing parents who love each other and who provided a great example and who spent time with us. And who like, so a lot of other areas of my life were completely cushy and easy mm-hmm. and wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I, I really, I get frustrated with people. It, it's an, it's a human, it's natural human nature, but we, we tend to do this thing where we, we want to compare all the time. Mm-hmm. And I often get feedback from people like, oh, I, I've had challenges. They, they always preface it with, it's nothing like what you've been through. <laughs> but, right? And I understand where the, why they say that. But yes. at the same time, it, what's challenging to me is not what's challenging to you and vice versa, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't know how I would have dealt with my parents getting divorced. I never had to deal with that. I don't right. know what, yeah. how that would have affected me. Other people have been through it and it's not been a big like. I don't know. I think we all have the tools we need to deal with what we have to deal with. The question mm-hmm. is, do we tap into them or not? And do we choose to use them or not? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I was reading an article in the paper, well, in the paper, yeah, on online in the news um, just today about, like, what's going on in Syria and Turkey and civil mm-hmm. war and refugees. And mom and dad have been working to bring over their third refugee family to Canada now. Yeah. And so I look at those families and I'm like, shit, like, my life has been so cushy compared to... Yeah. Right. So it's all perspective. Perspective. It's all just. Yeah. But you're right. I, I, and one of the things that the reason why I keep speaking with to youth, and the reason that my wife sometimes tells me that I'm too hard on my kids, is because I want to. I want the Canadian kid who's living better than probably any person in the history of humankind has lived in terms of their quality of life. Like a middle class Canadian kid has it better than mm-hmm. virtually everybody anywhere has ever had it in the planet. Yeah, mm-hmm. and yeah. yet they don't appreciate, for the most part, don't appreciate that at all, no. right? Because they have no, because they have, it's not their fault. Yeah, they just yeah, have no perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have, they've never lived anything different. They I don't mean, know any different. My, I remember my daughter was, she would have been two the first time. I think we all went. My, my wife's parents took her three, the three girls, their husbands and and kids to Disney. The following year, my parents decided to do the same thing. So two years in a row, whole big family trip to Disney. So the next year, my daughter's like, so when are we going to Disney? I'm like. The first, the first time I went to Disney, the first time I went to Disney was I was 33. It was when you went to Disney. That was the first time I went to Disney. Like, yes. This is not something we do every year. Well, but her frame of reference is yeah. we do this every year, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's just a constant. It's about awareness, right? And, yes. And and just whether it's with ourselves or with our kids or with whoever, just remembering. Yeah. What we have. Yeah, and I guess to uh, to the point that uh, we've been on for the last 10 minutes, I think. It's unfortunate that to have a real sense of gratitude, you almost need big challenges in mm-hmm. life. And, and, and it's hard to, uh, and I guess that was my question when I really said, you know, why do we need motivation? Well, I think mm-hmm. it's because uh, we need to be reminded to be grateful. And it doesn't matter why we need to be grateful. We just need to be grateful. And we should not wait for the challenges in life. Mm. Yeah. You know, like my father, I, I think I told you this, friend. My father really started living when he was told he was dying. Mm. Mm. You know, he started and he was like 65, 70 years old, right? Um, because before that, oh, you know, if I die tomorrow, who cares, right? 
Then the doctor says, you know, you don't have that much longer. Oh, fuck, what am I going to do? I won't live now. Well, fuck, I've been telling you that for 50 years, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, but I think it comes, I mean, just, I think it comes with age as well. Like, I mean, I much more appreciate the little things in life now sure. than I did when I was in my teens or university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think as you grow old, you, you start... You definitely have a yeah. different perspective, and you have obviously lived a little bit more. But uh, yeah, the, the well, the 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 fact that life is finite starts to become more real to right. you, right? Because you start to, um, yeah. There, I, people talk sometimes about, oh, I I'd, I'd love to be able to live forever, or, or we you know getting into all this AI stuff and mm. gene therapy and bioscience, all this stuff about how we're gonna expand life spans for so many more decades and. And whatever, like if we can do that and people can have a good quality of life, fine. But like, I don't think that I would want to live forever, like, because there's no perspective at that point. Right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, what? Yes. Be, what? What really matters if you're going to be around for three thousand years? Yes. How can I say today matters? But when you've got one day left, today matters a lot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's kind of the yeah. That's true. That's true. So what's the end goal for you? Like, I mean, I know you're running a. This is your business. This is what you do, but. It seems it seems to be more than that. I mean, you have a message, and so what's the kind of the end goal for you? Um, I mean, I've got lots of I've got lots of like goals as far as what I want the business to do and where I want the message to go. But the goal for my audience member or the, or somebody who's sitting in a session is I want them to understand that they have the capacity to deal with whatever they're going to have to deal with, and if I can give them some tools to do that, great. Um, I think a lot of times we make our challenges way more difficult than they need to be mm-hmm. because we're afraid of being challenged. Like <laughs> it's this sort of like c- circle that, that feeds on itself, this negative feedback loop that says, I don't like difficult things. And so I get nervous because something might be difficult and then something is difficult and I don't know how to handle it. And that makes me uncomfortable. And, and so we just make things a lot worse than they need to be. And so a lot of what I'm doing now in terms of, the content I'm giving people is to just get them comfortable with the idea that like it's supposed to be hard. Mm -hmm. Stop being afraid of that. You can be uncomfortable and happy at the same time. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's something that, that can coexist Mm -hmm. as long as you understand, like as long as you get your head around that. Right. I mean, again, personal training would be very similar. Like if people can understand that, yes, this is, this is supposed to be like lifting this weight is uncomfortable and then you're going to be sore tomorrow and that's uncomfortable too, but that's, that's a good thing because it means mm-hmm. you worked out and it means your muscle is, you know, mm-hmm. been broken down and therefore it's going to repair and grow. And yep. like, that's all part of the process. Right. So yeah, I, I, I ask people all the time now to, to just embrace the idea that it's going to be hard. And, it, and in fact, if it isn't hard, if your life is like always easy, then you're probably doing it wrong. Cause you're yeah. not, you're not stretching yourself. You're not pushing yourself. You're not. So yeah, yeah I think we get too, complacent sometimes we get too used to just oh i'm in a comfort zone and I'm, let's let's coast for a while yeah and uh yeah i think you're right i mean sometimes you do need to to do hard things to yes you know to, to in order to improve whether it's physically or mentally mm-hmm. or in your in your relationships or so. we have a we have a fundamental psychological need to be challenged right like that's just it's in our it's in our dna it's in everybody's natural makeup Whenever you get to a point where you're not challenged ever, you, you'll notice that you get super bored because it's just like, mm-hmm. it's too easy. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet, we always seem by default to seek out the quicker, easier, faster, more convenient version of whatever we're trying to <laughs> it's true. Right? It's, so it's very sort of doesn't make any sense <laughs> in, in some sense. And then we live in this world where like easier and better have become synonyms, right? So if I can make something less difficult, right. simpler, easier... Like if you could give people a pill, we talked about this today. Actually, I had a, um, I just had a, a stress test as part of my heart transplant follow up, and because it's a little bit of a tangent, but I'll, I, it, there's a point at the end. Um, <laughs> they needed they need to bring my heart rate up to target heart rate so mm-hmm. that they can see what it'll do on the on the ultrasound, and they I can't get there on an exercise on a treadmill like it just doesn't work. So they they have a drug substitute they can give you dibutamine it's called and it basically causes your heart to race as it would during exercise. So I'm laying on a stretcher, but my heart rate is at like 150 beats a minute or whatever. Okay. So it's a very weird sensation. Wow. Um, but we brought that up. Like I said, oh, I got my workout today, right? Like I didn't do anything. <laughs> uh, 
And she was, she said, the cardiologist was like, well, no, not actually, because you'll notice you weren't breathing any different. You were breathing normally because it's a different receptor in your yeah, brain and yeah. your heart got to work out, but the rest of you didn't. And then we said, but you know, if there was a workout pill, like if you could just, people could take a pill instead of going to the gym, they would, right? No, not, right. Um, but that's kind of missing the point. Yeah. Right. You don't get the, you don't get the character building and the mental benefits and all of that stuff from the easy way out. No, exactly. It's, it's. I had clients, and and at the end, if they, you know, we are, we're always like do some goal setting, right? So you get your goal setting, and that's how they, that's how they see progress, right? So, and it was always at by the end of it, it was always they were happy that they reached a goal, but it was the process that they got there that they felt so satisfied that they were able to do it, mm-hmm. that they were able to, mm-hmm. to. to kind of like follow that road to get to their destination. The road that they traveled was so much more important than the actual goal. I don't know if you know what mm-hmm. I mean. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it was, it was so, it was fascinating that, you know, and I would see that with several clients like that. It was just, they would come back to me and say, wow, that was, you know, I never thought that I would be able to, not that it would be able to achieve the goal, but to do what was necessary to get to that goal. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's so interesting. Well, and yeah, and it it's th- what they learned and, and who they, I always say like, it, it's not about what you achieve, it's who you become in pursuit of what mm-hmm. you achieve that really matters because those are skills and, and mindsets and strategies that you can acquire that you can then refer- use and reference in other areas of your life, right? Yeah. So like running a marathon is fine and there's a nice medal that I think is hanging on a doorknob somewhere in my house. I couldn't even know where it is. Um, but it's more about the character development and the things I learned about myself and about hard work and about all that stuff that matters way more than being able to check off that, that bucket list thing kind of, you know? Yeah. Mark, do you ever see the uh, results of your uh, conversations with people like five years later, six years later? Yeah. Occasionally. Um, occasionally it's, I mean, the social media is really awesome in that, in that respect. Yeah. True that. Yeah. People hunt you down and find like, I got a, I got an email or no, a Facebook DM, uh, (laughs) from, uh, I'm going to call him a kid. He's probably like 23 or 24 now. And this happens every so often, but it was like, yeah, you spoke, you won't remember, but you spoke at my high school in like 2005 or eight or whatever it was. And you asked us to write down this goal and I wrote it down. And then this, here's me doing that thing. And I was like, wow. And, I mean, and, and he was sending that to me as like, you know, as a thank you, but I had, I, I remind him, I just, I planted an idea and then you went and executed, right? Like there were, yeah probably 800 other students in that gym yeah. that day and probably five of them did what you did yeah but you actually did something and that's yeah. that's super cool when you see and that. that's yeah. why we need the mark blacks of the world well, thank yeah. you yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah that's and, and i really y- you know your career now is not that different from what you wanted to do which is teaching right no except it's... when you teach you see more frequently the results right and the progress and in what you're doing now, it can get, I would assume, frustrating and, and, or just wondering, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what this, this will do to some people. Cause I, you know, you must see people in tears and, you know, people come to see you afterwards, but then you're off to the right. next thing. Right. So right. it's kind of nice that social media yeah. get, gets you that feedback. Yeah, you're right. It is. It is nice. Yeah. You're, and you're right about teaching. I say all the time, I, I get all of the best parts of teaching with pretty much none of the bad parts of because <laughs> so my, my wife is a teacher, so I, I see it every day, right? I was like, I get to do all the things that you get into teaching for and none of the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. Report cards and parents and yes. discipline and all the rest of that. I don't have to deal with any of that. Yeah, yeah. Pretty pretty nice. That's good. So what's next for Mark? Yeah. What's next? Uh second book has been like ninety percent done for too long, so that is coming soon, hopefully. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then just, do we know the title? Can you scoop the title? Uh, no, it, no? It, it, like, no, it's got a working title right now called the resilience roadmap. That may be what it's called, but take a it, deep it, breath. It's, it's, oh, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> take a deep breath. <laughs> take a deep breath. Um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be all around how to, how to develop resilience. Okay. Uh, how to, how to deal with difficult things. Um, and then there's a, there's another book brewing about about doing difficult things. I really think like we need to get back as a society. We need to get back to doing things that are hard yes. mm-hmm. purely for the sake that they're hard. Mm. Cause I think, you know, if you even think, even think about two generations ago, like we don't have to go back very far. Just 
kind of existing was difficult. And yeah. so people like, you know, people worked on farms yeah. and they worked hard exactly. and yes. they didn't have time to sit and contemplate life because they were just trying to figure out how to stay alive and feed their kids. Mm-hmm. And the easier our life gets, the more we lose that because we don't have to do it anymore. Um, and so therefore I think we lose a lot of the lessons that come from that. Most importantly, just the confidence to know that you can do it. Mm-hmm. So when I see, I have, a, I have some pet peeves about our education system and not letting kids fail. And I think that sucks. And everybody gets a medal. For yeah, everybody, gets a, everybody gets a medal. Everybody, <laughs> you everybody, participated. Yay! everybody passes to the next grade, yeah, all, all that sh- stuff. You showed up. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Can't, can't change all that in one day, but no. yeah. So the book and then the podcast is going to continue. And then continue. the podcast will continue. And I mean, I'm gonna, I, the, the, my big, big kind of goal for myself is to, is to impact a million lives. Um, how you measure that, I don't know, other than mm-hmm. I keep track of roughly how many people I get to speak to in a year. And, um, but like, like anything, I will get there and then that will be unsatisfying and I'll have to find something else, right? Yeah. Like, I, I do believe in goals because I think they're helpful in giving you direction. But if you tie your sense of happiness or well-being to achieving them, then you end up in trouble because you get there and realize that there's another peak on top of that mountain yeah. and there's another one after that. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, you'll, I'll never get there, wherever there is, until I'm dead. But Can we run a marathon together? You just name the day and time. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> you caught you on that never one. Never mind. Called your bluff. <laughs> name the day and time. <laughs> I've committed to doing a triathlon this summer. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Yeah, a sprint, like a very short one. But yeah. that means I've got a whole lot of swimming to do between now and June because I'm horrible. A swimmer. Yeah. I mean, I, I, people say, can you swim? I say, I, I cannot drown. Like I can make sure I, I can make sure I don't die, but I am not an efficient swimmer. So Mark, before we end, like what's, what's a, your last message? What, what would you like to throw up there? Oh, wow. Um, I usually leave people with the live today thing, but I think it's, it, for me these days, it's really about do difficult things. Challenge yourself. Push yourself. Mm. Um, yeah, if you're presented with two options, take the harder one. Just just to show yourself that you can do it. Mm. Um, and and because of who you will become and what you will learn in the process of doing that. Wow. It, it's so funny that you mentioned that because I, I do martial arts and our instructor has always told us, like, he will make us do stuff in the most difficult way. Like in, if you're, if we're in a stance, for example, he'll want us in the lowest stance that we can possibly handle. So that he said that you should work three times as hard in the gym where we are so that if you are encountering something in life, that it becomes, it's easy Mm. because you've, you've been through so much more, so much more pain and you've done so much more hard work that when you're having to do it in real life, Jesus. it's easy. So I think that's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's funny. It's, it seems like it's a kind of a, culturally, it seems like it's a new idea, but it's, no, no, it's, it's all, it's stoicism from like the Greeks thousands yeah. of years yeah. ago who talked about this same stuff. So yeah. yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. Great. Yeah. Well, Mark, Mark, thank you so much. My pleasure, guys. pleasure. Pleasure. First, First, I have to say, like I've done a few podcasts. First time I've gotten to have scotch while <laughs> yeah. doing a podcast. Well, that's so. kind of our thing. That's yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Yeah, that's that's it's a good way to make people come back. That's, that's right. how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> Straight from the bend. <laughs> Mark, all, right. all the best. Thank you and health. Cheers. 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 Well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation. If you did, you could do us a big favor and share with your friends or rate us wherever you listen to this podcast. Our goal is truly to highlight the Maritimes, and we can only do this with your help. If you didn't like our conversation, well, what's the matter with you? Nah, just kidding. Our motto is one day better. That means we always want to be one day better than we were yesterday. So leave us a comment on Facebook and tell us how we can be better. We'd appreciate it, and we might even read your comment on our next podcast. Thanks for listening, and remember, look at everyone like they have something to teach you. See you next time. This podcast is produced by Straight from the Bend Productions.